Well, so uh, we last week I um, started, uh, I guess you would say what I said was going to be a series on uh, having to do with the parables. Uh, the parables where Jesus is preaching, and we'll explain a little bit about that here in a second, about he's preaching through parables in Matthew chapter 13. And one of the things that I had brought up that I, I said was that there was a, it seems to be a shift in his ministry that, that caused him to begin to preach a little differently to where he was specifically using veiled language. And we're going to describe what a parable here is in a moment, but Jesus had proven himself as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords upon this earth uh, by through the miracles that he had performed, right? But as the crowds grew and love for him grew, also opposition against him grew. Because the leadership of Israel, the, the you know, if you don't understand who they are, Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious leaders, just like religion today, it's no different. You go to various type churches and they all have different signs on their, on the, you know, on the door or whatever, however you want to say it. But religion is not really interested in giving the people the real Jesus. Religion, what it wants to do, what I'm trying to say is what religion wants to do is it wants to control people. It wants to give them only what it feels like they need. And it doesn't want to give them the real Jesus because, <clears throat> listen, the real Jesus will liberate right. God's Amen. people. The real Jesus will give you liberty and freedom and even give you the ability to go straight to the Lord. Amen. And then all of a sudden the preacher doesn't feel like he's as important as what he should be. But that's not the preacher's purpose. The preacher's purpose is not to be God for the people. Not to be a mediator between God and the people. There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. And but religion doesn't want to do that. It wants to it wants to hold on it without even realizing it. It wants to control. And so that's what they were doing. But they accused him. This was really the big part. They accused him of not operating under divine power, but instead operating under satanic power. If you'll remember that passage of scripture where they said he doesn't cast out devils by the power of God, but instead he casts out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. And what they were talking about was Satan right there. And, and we talked about that last week and we actually preached that. Uh, last week, but look, let's go to let's go to some uh, and go ahead and read these passages of scripture for this first parable we're going to preach out of uh, Matthew chapter thirteen. And there's going to be a little bit of overlapping, and it's a good little bit of reading. But you know, like I've always told you, I don't apologize for reading the Bible because Paul told young Timothy, pay attention to the public reading of scripture. Because it was it's important, right? Yeah. It's important. It's a shame you got to say that in the world today. But some churches they don't want to read this much Bible because they're scared their people gonna fall asleep. They're gonna get bored. They're not gonna be happy because you're not exciting them and getting them riled up and shouting. But we're gonna read the Bible, amen. All right, Matthew chapter thirteen, and we're gonna start with verses one through eleven. Then we're gonna back up to verse ten and read through seventeen. All right. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and forthwith, that means immediately, they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold. Some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, disciples. We've learned this before, but the word disciples simply means a learner of Christ. It describes a person that's interested in learning things about Jesus and his kingdom. Amen. He's answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, 
the other people that aren't disciples, that aren't learners. Oh, they're still in the crowd. You got to understand that. They're, these people are still in the crowd. They've still come by the seaside. Let's hear what Jesus has to say. But to them, it is not given. For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not from him shall be taken away. Now, I was supposed to stop at verse 11 <clears throat> so that I could back, back up to verse 10 and emphasize verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And now Jesus begins to give his answer. He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know, but like we just read, but unto them it is not given to know. Now look at verse 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables. This is why. Because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. What he's really saying is this. They're here by the seaside, just where you were. Their eyes beheld me, their ears heard me. But they never really perceived me and they never really understood me. They might have listened, but they really didn't hear. And I knew they were going to be that way. And so that's why I purposely, this might really mess up your theology. Because what God is saying, what Jesus is saying is I spoke to them purposefully in veiled, mysterious language so that they wouldn't understand. Because he knows the motives of people's heart. And he knows the fact that some people don't really want to know the ways of God. They don't really want to know the word of God. <clears throat> and so therefore, even though they'll show up, even though they'll show up, they don't really, really, really want to know what God's word is saying. Now, thank God they show up because maybe one day they'll be like me and they won't just be showing up anymore. Amen. And they'll really have a desire. <laughs> Praise God. I mean, I remember where I was. So, therefore, so then he goes on to say, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy. And in the King James, he says, Esaias, but it's King James for Isaiah, which says, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. This is continues to be Isaiah for this people's heart is waxed gross. It's kind of like the idea of I've said this before, bacon in a pan after you fry it. You know what it looks like when the grease congeals? That's what the idea is, because in Isaiah it says their heart has become fat. It's like a layer of fat that prevents the word of God. It's like a callus that won't let the word of God penetrate the heart. He says, and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. In the passage of Isaiah, I didn't really plan on talking about this a whole lot, but you got to remember, Isaiah is approximately 700 years before Jesus ever walked on the face of the earth. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. I didn't come to preach this this morning, but the word, the idea of Uzziah and their king is that back in that time frame, Israel's strength was in their king. Uzziah, who was a good king for the most part, died. And when he died, their strength was dried up. Isaiah sees Jesus. Truth be told that many times in our own life, it's not until our own strength dies that we really get a revelation of the Lord. Amen. Whenever he said, I saw the Lord, he was seated on the throne. The train of his robe filled the temple with glory. And the seraphim, which were forms of angels, began to cry, holy, holy, holy. And it caused a thunderous shaking to where the doorposts of the temple began to reverberate. Then God spoke and showed Isaiah that he was a man of unclean lips. And he lived amongst the people of unclean lips. Isaiah's response was, woe unto me. For I am a man of unclean lips. This is the prophet of God. And you know what? This is a very sobering word. Not just for the people that sit in the pew, but for the preacher behind the pulpit. Understanding that whenever you enter into the presence of the Lord and you get a real revelation of God. I know that I'm kind of like one of these people that sometimes I might even come across. You know, I'm all about, yeah, I do. Give me some knuckles and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes it even comes out in my preaching. But to be truthful, the fact of the matter is this. We, we may not like to see it this way. When you get a revelation of the Lord, you begin to realize how unlike him you really are. Amen. And you begin to realize that your heart is not okay with him. And I don't care how much you come to church and how good you 
you think you're doing with the Lord? He is holy, amen? And when you come into the presence of a holy God, the revelation that you are not holy is supposed to come upon you. But at the same time, the way that God does his work is that he does that to soften the heart, to cause the heart to cry out, to say, Lord, I need forgiveness. And guess what he does? He rushes in because that's exactly what happened. Because the Bible teaches us in Isaiah 6 that one of the seraphim took a coal from the altar. The coal of the altar was where the sacrifice was burned, which was a type of the cross. And only through the cross and what Jesus did, does true forgiveness come. And that angel took that coal and touched it to Isaiah's lips. And he said that he, that he understood that now he had been cleansed. Then the voice of God said this, whom will I send? Isaiah said, send me, Lord. And that's whenever God says, go and tell them. Basically, I'm paraphrasing. But as you tell them, this is what's going to happen. Their eyes aren't going to see. Their ears aren't going to hear. Because their heart is full of fat. If they would hear. And they would see. Then they would be converted. And now in Matthew. The words of the Lord speaking in parables. Is a fulfillment of that. Because while the crowds are thronging him. There's a very small remnant. That really wants to know what he's saying. And, them, and the rest of the people. Along with the religious leaders are really in opposition to the kingdom of God and to his king. All right, verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. You ever just give the Lord glory that you can actually understand the Bible now? Yes. I called Robert up one time about a year ago, and I said, dude, I know this is going to sound silly, but I'm just so excited because I actually, when I open up the Bible and read it, I understand what I'm reading. I can turn this book now to 2 Kings 19, and I don't even know, it's about Hezekiah and about how he prayed before the Lord, and I can understand when I read it, what I'm reading, but it's taken years in the ministry of the Holy Spirit working in my heart. Anyway, I'm just trying to say, blessed are your eyes, yes. for they can see. Blessed are your ears, for they can hear Amen. the word of the Lord. I think we take for granted how precious that sure. really is. He says, uh, for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. So now this is the last section that I wanted to read because he's going to give the interpretation of the parable so that his disciples can really understand what's going on. He says, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that hears the word and anon. With joy he receives it. Yet has he not rooted himself, but he endureth for a little while. In other words, he endures for a little while. For, but when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by, he is offended. The word offended there is the word. It's where we get the word scandalized. It describes almost kind of like a roadblock, something thrown in the way to mess you up. Boy, look, I, I don't mean to get off on the rabbit trail. The other day I was driving. Y'all, y'all driving drive to home? Yeah. I mean, do, if you do, if you go a lot, you go. Y'all go on that. Look, y'all need next time y'all go to home on the way. You need to look on the left side of the roadway. At some point in time, you're going to see an old, broke up, dilapidated wooden chair that's just sitting there slowly decaying can I tell you that the preacher is the one that actually ran over that chair the re you know why because it was in the back of somebody's truck and the thing fell out and there was nothing I could do dude like because I got pretty quick reaction time but it's like I'll look to the right and right there behind me is a car I can't just swerve over because I'm going to cause it and like it's just like okay dude just Grit your teeth and bear it. And boo I mean, I'm talking about a big old thick dining room chair. And there, anyway, a, an obstacle in the road. It made me think of that. That tried to cause, cause you to veer off in the wrong direction. A persecution that tries to come against you and what the word desires to perform Amen. in your life. It says, uh, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. 
But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So we're, we're talking about parables. Amen. I like the fact that Jesus said, who has ears to hear, let him hear. I want to make it clear that it's not that their ears don't work. I've talked about this before, but instead they don't really have the desire to perceive. I was thinking about ears. I was thinking about the fact that Eve's ears were poisoned. You know that Eve's ears were poisoned because of what she was willing to listen to. She, and since then, the whole human race has been paralyzed and poisoned from that time frame. She listened to a voice which destroyed her faith. And ever since that day, whether it's listening to the wrong thing or refusing to listen to the right thing, it's the same result. Poison enters the heart as it makes its way from the ears to the mind and then to the heart. You can go ahead and throw that quote up there. I gave Man Manuel a, a, a quote this morning. Because when I read that, I, when, when I was reading what I just wrote right there, I thought about about two weeks ago, I was talking in, my, in the house on Sunday after church, and I made a comment about the Hamlet. And I said, man, in Hamlet, I don't know if Mr. Paul will remember, he, but he asked me. I said, there's a scene in Hamlet where this guy sneaks into the room and he pours poison in his ear. And Mr. Paul's like, why pour poison in the ear? So when I read that about Eve and the poison that entered her ear, like I went and I, I, I hurried up and I checked out this Hamlet thing. Why did Hamlet write, why did Shakespeare write the poison in the ear? All right. And it was because it was like an allegory to how you can't stop what it is that you hear. And like a poison, it enters into the door of the ear and enters into the heart. So here, here's Hamlet. Okay, just bear with me. I know this old English, but it's just a point. It's, it's, it's like, you know, the beauty of Shakespeare. Sleeping within my orchard. So the scene is, is that he's sleeping. Next verse. He says, my custom always of the afternoon upon my secure hour, thy uncle, your uncle, stole with juice of cursed heaven on I had to look up the word heaven on. It's like a vegetable or botanical growth of a plant that's poisonous that they made a tincture out of to put in this little thing. He says, in a vial and in the porches of my ear did pour the leprous distillment. He was talking about the fact that a poison was poured into his ear and that it killed him. I know that we're talking about refusing to hear the good, really the medicine, the antidote that will save your life. But I also want you to be aware and that has to do with false doctrine and that some of the parables that come up later that like a poison that's poured into the ear, it results in death. Same thing that happened to Eve. And interestingly, I know I've said it already, but through these parables, there is a purposeful move by God to cause a specific group of people to lack understanding. Now I've said this to y'all before, but I want you to I want to remind you that I like I like to talk about this kind of stuff. That this word right here in the Greek is this parable. This is where we get the word from. Para below. Side Throw. That's where we get the word ball in English, right? Side throw. To throw alongside one another. So what happens in a parable is, is that two things are put side by side. Something that's a known truth with something that's an unknown truth. In this particular parable, the known truth is how a seed grows in ground. Because the Jewish people were very agricultural and they understood the concept of a seed. But what they didn't understand so the Lord explained it to his disciples what that the seed represented the word of God and it, the, the effects of where the seed landed, landed had to do with the environment where the seed was placed. Right. In this parable, the sower is about the known truth. It's, it's about it's about Jesus or, or anyone you for that matter, me for that matter, sowing the seed of the eternal gospel. And the truth about it is that the differing responses of the literal seed, right? But then the differing responses of the seed of God's word and how it's affected by the condition of the heart. Just as the soil affects the way a real seed grows, so the condition of the heart affects the way the word of God grows in the heart. God's intended response is that the seed 
which is his word, would find itself landing in an environment or a soil that is conducive or a good place, right, to bring life. A place where it will be nourished and cared for. A place where it will grow and produce fruit for the kingdom. But in each of the first three responses, what I want you to know is this, is that they didn't really care about the word of God. It's a sad truth that what we're learning is that three-fourths of the time, the seed doesn't produce. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that word right there won't go well in a Word of Faith church. That word right there won't go well to most people in their understanding of the way the Word of God works. But what I'm telling you is, is that it's real clear, only in one type of soil did it produce the intended fruit. More often, in most people, and that's just the truth, God's word falls and dies, but it's not God's fault. It's not his word's fault. It's the heart of the man into which the seed was sown. That's the problem. The heart is hostile to the growth of God's word. The first one was the wayside. And ultimately, it describes that there was a lack, there was no understanding. Now, a wayside has to do with a trodden path. Really, if you look up the word way or side, really, you'd have to click on side. The word is hadas. I've talked about hadas before because where the Bible says that John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, prepare ye the way, the hadas of the Lord. The word hadas or, literally means a path. It means a well-trodden path. It's easily discerned the right way to go. So, But in this context, it's not talking about the way to Jesus. What it's talking about is a trodden path. You do realize that whenever people have farms or they're, they're doing, like at least back in those days, if they had to plant the seed by hand, they, they wouldn't want to walk on top of the same soil where they were planting the seed. So many times there was a pathway for them to be able to walk their way through and then they would pour the seed. And so what's happening is, is that along the way, many times seed falls on the trodden path. The idea of a trodden path is that it's hard. In order for seed to take root, then the soil has to be broken up. It has to be plowed in order for it to be receptive. Spiritually, this describes a heart that is not repentant and it's not soft towards God nor his word. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter three, verse, I'm sorry, chapter four, verses three through four. I think I'm actually maybe going to, yeah, no, we're just going to stick with this, right? Jeremiah 4, verses 3 through 4. It says, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground. The, the word fallow is basically descriptive of hard ground. Break it up, till it, soften it up, and sow not among thorns. Look at this circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. I mean, you, you do realize what he's talking about there. Right? Remove the flesh that stands upon the surface of your heart, the hardness that is preventing my word and my will from entering in and doing the work that you need to do. He's talking spiritual here. He's not really talking. He's using this as an analogy. He says, you men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. This passage in Jeremiah is referring to the fact that their ground is hard. It's really their hearts that are hard towards the things in the word of God. You know, these parables, like I've said, they're addressed to both believers and unbelievers alike. And this hard, unplowed, unplowed ground represents a person that has a hard heart and is indifferent towards the word of God. When I say indifferent, I put in my notes, he yawns. Because I was going to try to be an actor, but I don't know how good. Uh, you know, I can't even yawn right now. But you, know, but you get the point. Oh, Lord, here he is again. The preacher's preaching. Let me go take a nap. I'm so. Yeah. And listen, this comes of all ages. This ain't just kids. Because I see a lot of kids yawn, but it's okay. I yawned too when I was a kid. But it's not okay, but you get the point. Indifferent towards the Word of God. 
you know, uh, and, and to, towards God's word. It's not really describing a person who lacks the cap capability to understand. But the reality of it is, is that instead it's a person that really doesn't want to understand. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. When Jesus interprets this parable, the result of this is that the seed is stolen. Right? There are people in and out of churches who could care less about whether they really hear the word of God. Listen, what I'm trying to say is this. I understand that, that, that I'm just saying like young people or even some adults in here. I, I'm not like, I hope you don't think that I'm naive. I hope you don't think that I'm not somewhat perceptive. I realize, and it, you may not like it when I say this, but I'm going to say it. I realize that there's probably some people in this church that they really don't like my style of preaching. I'm not saying this so that you'll feel sorry for me because I'm not apologizing for the way that I preach. I know how God has called me to do, and I'm not going to apologize anymore. But I understand that there's probably some people that don't really like my style of preaching or teaching. There's some people that love it. Okay? I'm just a vessel. And probably the only reason some of those people come to this church is because they truly believe in their heart that what is being spoken here is the truth. I get all of that. Amen. I'm glad that they love the truth. But you can't always blame it on the preachers, the point that I'm trying to make. Because you either have a love for the truth or you really don't have a love for the truth. So if I got to cause all kind of spectacle, you know, because I used to go back to whenever well, I used to go to the old church and in order to reach the young people over there, you had to have basically like, you know, illuminated lights, strobe lights. I mean, there was even a deal. I told you all about that recently where they started stamping their hands and running it under a black light like they were getting entrance into a club. And it's like, dude, really? So what? We got to cause all this. And maybe it may not be all that, but it's like if it's not a spectacle in order to reach out to quote unquote young people. What? Well, look, if you're getting the word of God and you're hungry for the word of God, I understand. I understand all these things. But what I'm trying to say is, is that at the, when, when you get down to the bottom of it, sometimes the truth of the matter is, is that we don't really have a love for the word of God. Sometimes that grows. I mean, I'm being honest with you. I didn't always have a love for the word of God. But I thank God now that I do have a love for the word of God. Amen. And, and so because they're lays off fair. People have a lays off fair attitude. They yawn. They're indifferent towards the very word of God. Right. They come to church. Maybe because their parents make them, you know, to be fair, there's been times that I felt like I was having to make my own kids. I mean, look, I know one of them's in here today, but that's sometimes that's how I feel. Maybe I'm not always right in the way that I think. Maybe they really do want to come to church. Maybe the devil's just beating them up. I don't know. I'm just telling you that I'm just like you. I'm a human being and I don't always get it right. But sometimes it comes across to me that basically if I didn't like kick them in the backside or like try to get them moving that they wouldn't come to church and many times people's parents might make them come to church or they or it's adults and they think that just by me going to church i'm gonna make god happy i don't think any of y'all feel that way but what i do believe is that there's a tons of churches filled today with tons of people that feel that way and they don't really want to hear the true word of god any more than the, you know what i'm saying and, and, and they give them an hour, but as far as for really wanting to know what God's saying, they don't. And the heart is hard towards God's word. That's the trodden path by the wayside. And the devil steals the word right away because the word of God says that the fowl of the air was like the devil and his demons. And that seed is stolen and snatched away. And once again, it's not because, oh, it was so hard to comprehend. That's your fault, preacher. I've heard people say before that you get too deep in the word and you speak the word in such a way that people can't understand it. No, it's because of the heart of man. Truth be told is that even in the parables, they have to be interpreted. Sometimes God's word has to be interpreted, but we need the Holy Spirit to help us to understand it. God, listen, there's sometimes the word of God's not even written in a parable and people still can't understand it. It's like Paul said, not just the Jewish people. It said that there was like a, 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 a veil over their eyes that when they would read the Old Testament, Jesus was hidden from them. But it's not just the Jews of, of the, the people that have refused Jesus. Instead, it can be even believers that sit in churches that are veiled. Amen. 
Lord, we need you to remove the veil so that we can see your word. That was point number one. That was the soil number one. That was the wayside, hard earth that needs to be tilled up. Amen. We need our heart to be softened towards the word of God. Second thing has to do with stony ground. I know stones sound like hard. It seems like it'd be basically the same thing. But what happens to this seed is that there's no root and persecution kills it. In the land of Israel, there's a lot of different types of soil. That's because there's a lot of different types of, we use a fancy word, topography. Meaning, you got hill country, you got valleys, and you got different kinds of soil. And in many of those mountainous areas, there's a lot of stones in the soil. If you've ever watched some old movies, uh, you know, there's like, especially in Ireland, where they grow potatoes, there was a lot of rocks and they'd have to take the rocks out of their soil because you can't sow seed in a field that's full of rocks. <clears throat> And in order for the seed to take root, the farmers have to remove the rocks, right? Look at Isaiah chapter 5. This is just a passage of scripture that talks about that, removing stone. But I think we're going we're gonna to read verses 1 and 2. Those are the main ones. But I think then we're going to move on all the way through verse 7 because it's just good. <laughs> it says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved Touching his vineyard. Now, this is Old Testament. This is Isaiah, 722 BC, 700 years before Jesus. But whenever God's talking about his beloved, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus has a vineyard. It was Israel, Judah. But guess what? They rejected him. It's just like you and I are also the vineyard of God. He says, My well beloved has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof. <clears throat> And planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. It didn't bring forth what he intended it to do. He did all the work. He made a fence to protect it from the foxes. He took all the stones out so that the soil was properly cultivated. But yet at the same time, it didn't grow what it was that he expected it to grow. If you don't think Jesus is using some of this terminology in these parables, and even whenever he gets into the, 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 the tares and the wheat, because instead of it growing the right kind of grapes, it grew the wrong kind of grapes. And in the kingdom of heaven, there's not only good true believers, but there's also counterfeit believers, then I'm just telling you, Jesus is using some of this terminology. Let's go ahead and just read through verses uh, three through seven to see, because it just reminds me of what we're talking about. He says, Oh, now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Take a look at the vineyard, take a look at me, and try to determine really what he's saying is, whose fault is this? Go to the next verse. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked at it, it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. He's saying, I did all the work. Why do you reckon <laughs> that instead of bringing forth good grapes, it brought forth bad grapes? What could have been? He goes, go to the next verse. He says, and now go to. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. In other words, what he said in this parable, he said, to him who has, more will be given. To him who doesn't have, it's going to be taken away. If it's not my fault. My word went forth. I, I prepared it to go forth and for it to have its intended effect. But instead of bringing forth good fruit, it brought forth bad bad fruit. This is just another truth to the fact that it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. It's not God's word that's that fault. It's the heart of man. Stones left in the heart represent the fact that people just don't care enough to do the work required to know and nurture the word of God. Does that word work bother you? I hope not. Because I know I, come, I preach against works-based Christianity. But do you realize that it does require work to learn the word of God? I mean, they got some people in here that have been studying the Bible for a long time. I mean, I'm not trying to call you out, but I would imagine Hannah, when she was a little girl, probably even wrote scripture down on index cards to memorize them. Didn't you? Yeah. Okay. And that's my point. I didn't even know that. She never told me that. But I, would, I could just about imagine that. And, and the point that I'm trying to make is, is that even if our motives weren't always the purest, we were trying to learn the word of God. Amen. Amen. And, and, and it requires work to be diligent, to know the word of God, to prepare the soil of the heart in order for it to be able to receive the truth of God's word. 
God repeatedly tells us that the growth of the believer is connected to the Word of God. Look at 2 Peter 3.18. We're going to move fast on these scriptures. 2 Peter 3.18. It says, <clears throat> But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Look at 1 Peter 2, 2-3. Two through three. He said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. You ever seen a baby when it's hungry? <laughs> Boy, look, I see it all the time. Sometimes, like, I have to dig, I mean, this is kind of gross, but I have to dig wax out of their ears with this little ear spoon thing because I got to see their eardrums. And they, dude, they fuss and they scream. It's like, oh, Mr. Matt killed my baby. And that's what it seems like. And then as soon as that mama sticks that bottle in that baby's mouth, it just shuts up and it's just the happiest thing. Basically, what the Word of God is saying right here is, is that like a newborn babe desires milk, that's what our heart as believers is supposed to be desiring. We're supposed to crave the Word of God. Well, if you don't crave the Word of God right now, guess what? It's a good time to start praying. Lord, give me a craving and a desire for your Word. Look at Colossians 3.16. It says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, one of the things that I think of oftentimes when I think of fellowship regarding the people of God is that in the Old Testament, not I'm sorry, in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Acts, when you look at how they fellowship and they got together and they spent time together, you know what, what, what they did? They, all, they took communion and they talked about Jesus. Yes. Amen. I hate to say it, but in, the, but in the modern church, whenever people are trying to build, many times build fellowship gatherings, first of all, fellowship is important. I, and and less what, I tried, I probably shouldn't even take time to say this, but I'm going to say it. I remember when I used to go to the old church, dude, I was so, so dogmatic about the importance of understanding the Word of God. I remember telling the preacher, if you haven't been watching, I was wrong. I told the preacher, dude, fellowship? Come on, man. We need to focus on the Word of God. And you know, one thing I do love about that preacher, there was times he got on my nerves because he wouldn't, he wouldn't submit to me. <laughs> he wouldn't, dude. He'd hug him down. He's like, you think you obstinate boy. I'm just as rebellious as you. He'd say this. But that day, he said, man, you're wrong, dude. In the church, we need fellowship. And he was right. We need fellowship. And there's nothing wrong with allowing young people to get together and do stuff that they like to do to hang out. But what I will tell you where they were wrong was that they wanted the fellowship to take place without the word of God included. That's wrong. True Christianity has the word of God included in its fellowship. Doesn't have to be an hour-long message. I don't know how long it has to be, but the Word of God needs to go forth in order, in my opinion. That's what Christians do. They got Jesus on the inside of them, and guess what? The real Jesus is supposed to come out, amen, and our communion and our fellowship together. That's what we have in common is Jesus and the Word of God. All right. The seed on stony ground has neither depth nor root, and the sun on a seedling is like the heat from persecution on a believer without roots. And the little seedling is scorched and withered before it can grow and become strong. What's so interesting to me, so, so you just think about that. I mean, what the idea here is, is that the Word of God went and it landed on some soil that has a stone in it, and the root can't really penetrate and go deep down into the soil, but yet at the same time, you've seen it. Because I, I did all used to work in Venezuela. I know this is another rabbit trail. And one day, we were over here working in Venezuela, and we were using this kind of, it wasn't an oil base, but it was like an organic-type mud for this blowout. And we used to use these cocoa mats. Y'all ever seen cocoa mats? You step on them. It's kind of like an a out, outdoor house mat that you put, and it's made out of coconut type, you know, that thick brown stuff, and they're kind of cheap to, to stand on so that your feet and your back didn't hurt you, right? And so they would have that up in that basket. We were a hundred and something feet up in the air, and all of a sudden I looked down there, I'm like, dude, what is that by your foot? It was a watermelon plant growing in that coconut mat because of the mud, and he was up there eating watermelon and spitting the seeds, and that thing just sprung up and started to grow on that cocoa mat. It's like, who's ever heard of such a thing? 
And that's basically what's happening to this seed. It fell and it has no depth. It's not that watermelon plant wasn't going to last. But it has no depth of earth. And when the sun comes out, it scorches it. How many times have you seen people in the church, they come to church. I, look, I don't mean to be negative, but I got people all the time come up to, that have come in and out of these doors. And they come one time. And the first thing they do is they come up afterwards. They, Dude, that was good. I'll be back next week. I ain't never seen them again. I'm not fussing about it. It just is what it is. They, people spring up quick. And sometimes it's more than just one week. Sometimes they stay for a while. But guess what? When persecution comes, when people start coming against them, oh, so now you're a Christian. It happened to me before. I can remember that I went to rehab one time, three times. I went to rehab three times. One time I was in rehab, and every time I was in rehab or detention home, the Lord would send somebody over there to tell me about Jesus. And while I was in rehab in Greenville Springs, Baton Rouge, the Lord sent some people over there, some good old faithful Baptist folk, and they were talking to me about Jesus. And I'd already heard about Jesus. My sister was a Pentecostal, and she believed in Tam... Anyway, I had already given my heart to the Lord at one time and gone up to the altar and done all, you know, given my heart to Jesus and it stirred it all over again. Dude, I started feeling guilty about all the things that I had done. Oh man, I stole Darren Vaughn's bike in Houston one time when I went to visit him and he had it sitting there at the door. He'd never know who stole it because I'd already moved away. And I started just feeling about all this stuff, repenting to the Lord. Oh my goodness, I just committed all these sins, right? And when I got out, I was riding that bike I stole from Darren Vaughn. And I'm riding down the street with my friend, with one of my f friends, and I asked him the question. I said, "Dude, have you ever thought about Jesus? Jesus?" And he just busted out laughing. You know what? I didn't say another word about Jesus. I just shut up, sealed my lips, and went on with my business. Went back to my old way of life. Persecution arises like a sun scorching. There's no root. There's no foundation. The stone. You know, people are not putting the work in to build a foundation. Uh, and and it, just, it just shut me up and I, and I went back. Look, but you know what's interesting to me, though, is, is that because persecution, according to the Bible, is actually supposed to provide a good environment for <coughs> growth. I mean, I'm not saying that. Jesus said it. Paul said it. James said it. Let's look at some, some passages of Scripture. Look at... Uh, look at Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. It says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you. That, what that word revile is not describing hate, but it's describing they're like talking, I don't know how else to say it, trash to you because of your Christianity. They're, they're using language to talk down to you and to, to scold you. And to try to make you feel like a fool because of your stand for, for the Lord. He says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Jesus says it's good when you get persecuted. But in the parable of the sower, persecution causes death. Why? Because there's no root. There's no foundation. They're not certain of who they are in Christ. They're not certain of who Jesus really is. Let's look at James chapter 1. I'm sorry, Romans 5 verse 3. Romans 5 verse 3. I know y'all are familiar with this one. Paul says, and not only so, he said, we glory in the hope of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulation works Patience. The idea of patience there, the word is really endurance. Teaching you how to stick to it. Teaching you that just when things don't go your way, when times get tough, when you're persecuted, that you don't just drag up and quit. You know, there's a lot of times people in the body of Christ, they just ain't, they don't have any, I know this isn't really a word, but I'm going to say it, stick to itiveness. They can't like just stick it out. 
You know, I, I thank God for my dad sometimes. I know this is off the trail, but my, my daddy used to say, boy, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and quit your crying. Stand up and be a man. And I'm glad that he told me those kinds of things. I can't do it in my own strength, daddy. I'll, I'll you know, I know, you, I don't know. I know I ain't supposed to be talking to you, but uh, Lord, tell my daddy, I can't do it in my own strength, dad. I can't just pull myself up by the bootstraps and I'm over here coming against the enemy, the adversary of my soul. But what I will tell you is I thank God that through trial and tribulation and hearing you say that and mixing that with the word of God, you don't have to just quit. You know, sometimes you wake up and you got a headache. Sometimes you wake up and you're just tired. Sometimes you wake up and you don't feel good. And so what do you do? What are you going to do? You're going to just roll over and quit? No, you get up and you go to church. I, am I trying to tell you, oh, now the preacher's preaching. You got to go to church in order to be saved. No, I ain't. But what I'm saying is the devil will come against you. Yes. Amen. In every way that you turn, every step that you take, and he will try to prevent you from coming to the house of God. And if everybody that came to this church forgot about the headache and forgot about whatever and rolled over and threw their feet on the ground and said, I'm going to church today, then the church would be filled. I believe that. Amen. James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That's another word for trials. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience and teaches you endurance. But let endurance have her perfect work. That you may be perfect. That means mature and entire, wanting nothing. Quit listening to that old devil when he tells you don't get up and go to church. When I first got saved, I said, I'm going to Sunday school because I need to learn the word of God. Because I heard somebody talk about the parable. And if I don't get the word of the Lord in my heart, I ain't going to have no root. And I'm going to get withered up. And next thing you know, I, ain't never, I barely made it to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> Sunday school, man, the devil put a slant. I can see him over there blowing that dust now. <laughs> blowing that like sleep dust all over me. And I was just like twinkle toes, just staying in the bed. Can't wake up, can't go to sleep. I'm not trying to pick on you if, you if you miss church because you get tired. I'm trying to tell you that we all deal with that. And the enemy yeah. is trying to. That was funny though, wasn't it? Yeah. Blowing that. Okay, anyway. All right, next. Look, all three said to rejoice or be joyful over persecution, but for those who have no root or depth, the persecution destroys their faith. Number three, thorny ground. The thorns are the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. They grow in the same place that the good seed grows. How beautiful it would be if there were neither cares nor deceptions to choke God's word in our hearts. Wouldn't that be a beautiful world? Just like the Garden of Eden. How beautiful. No sin, no deception, right? No cares. The word choke means to suffocate or to smother. With a, what a miserable death. I was thinking about that. What a miserable death to be so consumed with the external around us that we don't even realize that the God in us is dying. <coughs> so consumed about the cares of the world. How beautiful it would be if our flesh wasn't tainted by sin and all we wanted was Jesus and his word, what he offers. But just as the tree of life grew beside the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, the seed of the gospel grows in a garden where there are thorns. And everywhere we turn, there will be something going wrong and trying to cause stress in our lives. You know that, right? Every time you turn around, every time you turn a corner, you got out of one trial, here comes another one. Boo, let me tell you why. Because this earth is fallen, the sin of man is in the heart of man, and God will allow trial and tribulation. Somebody sent me a text the other day out of nowhere, and it had to do with Job and whatever the case. Long story short, God allowed Job to be tested with trial and tribulation. What the devil meant for bad, God meant for good. The devil wants to destroy you. The devil wants to destroy me. He wants to destroy the word of God in us. But God says, I'll let you go this far, but I won't let you go any further because guess what? He's trying to get the attention of the believer because he wants the believer to become hungry for the word. He wants the believer to have root. Everywhere we turn, though, there will be stress, something going wrong, trying to take our focus off of God and his work. Yeah. Not just going to church, trying to get you to drag up, to not 
to not to, to do whatever the Lord's called you to do or whatever the Lord's called us to do. We'll make excuses to shift our focus on, all, on what we have going on instead of what he has going on. Oh, that's the truth right there. That's good preaching, even if it don't sound good. We, we get so caught up in the cares of this world that we will take our eyes off what he has going on and we'll put them on what we have. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7. Bear with me. I know I'm going long this morning, but we won't be too much longer. 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7. He says, likewise, you younger. He's talking about younger preachers. Submit yourselves to the elders. Yeah, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And he said, cast your cares on the Lord. Don't hold on to him. Cast your cares on the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. He wants to take the burden off of you. Look in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. This is Jesus. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I thought about, I had these two scriptures already in there. And this morning when I read it, I noticed something for the first time. I didn't notice when I first put it in there. What I first wanted to talk about was just really releasing yourself of your burdens and your cares and giving them over to the Lord, right? Both of those scriptures talk about that. But you know what I also saw for the first time? They both also talked about humility. And one of them, Peter's saying, you need to be humble. And the other one, we're giving Jesus as the example of humility. And I thought about the fact that it talks about humility in both of them and how ludicrous it is. I put the definition for that. Causing laughter because of absurdity. Another word would be ridiculous. How ridiculous it is. For the heart of man to become so consumed with his cares that he neglects the cares of God. That is just ridiculous. I'm preaching to the preacher. Ridiculous that we do that. Now, I understand how it happens. And I know I'm talking hard this morning. I understand how it happens. Let, let, let God pull his hand back a little bit and touch it a little bit like Job got touched. And it's going to be hard not to realize that you got boils all over your body and you done lost all your wealth and your children have died and you're mourning. I get it. I've mourned before, lest I forget to tell you. I've experienced pain. But at the same time, it doesn't take away from the fact that it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a good thing for us to be so prideful and caught up in our own lives and our own cares that we neglect the work of the Lord. Some people think that if they could only just make a little bit more money, right, then all their problems would be solved. But in most cases, if we're honest with one another, the problem is not that we don't make enough money. The problem is that we spend too much. That's right. <laughs> and they spend their whole life chasing after a dream to get rich or allowing their hearts to be consumed with the cares of the world and the seed of God's word is neglected and withers and dies. Now, I don't mean to use people as an example without asking their permission, but one time I asked Mr. Larry, because I always like to ask people that are seasoned in their age and I know that they're retired, because I think about that sometimes because I'm getting old. I'm like, Mr. Larry, how did you save money? How did, what was your plan for retirement? He said, I didn't have no plan. He said, one day, I said, I'm tired of working. And his wife says, well, it's okay, baby. Go ahead and just quit. He said, well, how am I going to do that? She said, what are you talking about? All that time she had been saving money. He <laughs> said, he didn't even know. Dude, after you told me that, I told Danielle, I know you've been doing what that man told you to do and take $300 out of every check and hide it away. No, she ain't been doing that like, oh, Lord, Miss Jackie, well, I commend you because you... Praise God. It ain't that we don't make enough. It's because we spend too much. We keep doing it. Amen, brother. That's right. A word of wisdom from Mr. Larry. <laughs> Miss Jackie, sorry. Give, give the props where they belong. I'm going to give you some knuckles after. Or a good hug. That's what All right. Last one. The good soil. It's plowed. The stones have been dealt with and the thorns didn't suffocate it. And it produced 170 and 34, 30 fold. We're learning the same thing from this parable that we learned in the parable of the talents. God isn't expecting you to do what I do, and he isn't expecting me to do what Lauren does. 
But what he is expecting is that we would produce fruit. He expects, he respects a return. I'm telling you, God expects a return. In the parable of the talents, the good man comes back and he's like, give an account. Give an account on what you have done with what I gave you. The Lord is expecting a return, right? Amen. And if we, he, he says, uh, uh, but he does expect us to produce fruit for his kingdom. And if we don't, we better look more closely at our hearts. Three verses that we're going to close with real quick and we're going to go through them. Because it talks about Jesus and the vine. Look at John 15, 1 through 2. I'm talking about producing fruit for the Lord. Good soil where the seed can fall and produce the will of God. Jesus said in John 15, 1 through 2, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. That's to describe somebody that prunes and takes care of the vine. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. He cuts it off. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. In other words, he puts the trial to it to cause it to produce more fruit. So that, and, and look, look at this, John 15, verses 5 through 6, just a few verses down. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me, you got to stay there, you got to dwell there. And part of that is learning the word of God. And I'm not saying that it's just reading, no, it's faith in Christ and what Christ did for you at the cross. Continued faith in that, that allows you to be righteous in the eyes of God, that allows the grace of God to flow in your life, to forgive you, to strengthen you, to encourage you. But if you don't read, the word of God and ever don't start upon the process or be like Hannah was when she was young and start writing down some scriptures on some note cards and memorizing some stuff to get it on the inside of your heart. It's starting that process of getting the word of God in your heart. Guess what? It ain't never going to happen. No root is never going to take place if you don't ever begin to learn the word of God. That's part of abiding is learning and getting the word of God in you. He says, he that abides in me lives here, dwells here, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Look at John 15, 8. Look at this. This is good right here. We're closing with this because we're talking about soil. We're talking about seed. We're talking about fruit. Jesus says this, herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Don't let anybody lie to you and say you don't need to work for the kingdom of God. Don't let anybody lie to you and say that you weren't supposed to produce fruit. Don't let anybody lie to you and say, oh, that was the preacher's job. No, God's called you not just to invite people to church. But also to speak forth the word of God where you are. Amen. Amen. To be a witness for the kingdom of God. I've said this a million times and I'm closing with this. Not everybody's going to witness the same way. You're not all going to be like me. Thank God. There's a lot of people that get irritated with me. I'm just saying. Man, sometimes I don't shut up. Y'all know that. And some, some of y'all are calm, cool, and collected. Yeah? Some of y'all, man, got a sweet voice, sweet demeanor. And people just love hearing your voice. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's true. God's called us to bear fruit.